Well, thanks for the time, and I realize I'm the last thing between, before the break, so we'll move pretty quickly. Um, so my deck is not a, a sales deck, so let me tell you a little bit about my company and how I came to be part of the Metrics Lab family. Um, we wrote some technology that allowed us to passively meter media consumption through the handset. And this is five, six years ago, right? The iPhone wasn't out yet, and, and feature phones were still ruling the world, and Blackberries were the pinnacle. Um, but the gist of it is, is you install an app, and it reports back to us what TV, radio uh, you consume. And we get this data on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Uh, fast forward the story, as smartphones advanced, so did our technology. So now, not only do we gather what TV and radio you consume, but we get GPS data points, we get Wi-Fi data, uh, we can track all of this passively. Um, we're getting ready to launch, um, since being acquired by Metrics Lab, we're launching a national panel in the US, um, shortly followed by a launch in Europe. Um, so super exciting times, lots of things getting ready to take place, and if you're interested in the pilot in the US, let me know. We can talk about how to measure your traditional media and everything that's going on online. So that being said, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, or Lenny asked me to talk a little bit about some disruptive technologies. Um, and my background was in venture capital. So I started there, and I started looking at the world through the lens of the venture capitalists. So what are the people who are funding the technologies driving this? What are they thinking about? Um, so we'll go through a couple of bullet points there, and then we'll talk about mobile a little bit more. Um, so the first thing they talk about is the bureaucracies of decision making, right? How can we make things happen faster? Um, I think everybody recognizes this is the family tree of all the ad agencies. These are supposed to be the most creative, leading organizations in the world, and they're just rife with bureaucracy. And the decision making processes there are slow and painful and everything about it. Um, but it's not just in ad agencies, right? This happens in traditional media as well. So, you know, the print newspaper industry is, has lots of editors. You have to go through this level, this level, this level. Um, and then along comes a little startup. Um, at the time, it was Twitter. And Twitter made no sense to me when it launched, right? You've got it, you've basically like, text message news pieces, and it doesn't make sense until one day a uh, plane crashes in the Hudson. And having lived on the Hudson, this was big news for me, and so I could follow this via Twitter. And all of a sudden it made sense to me, right? I can curate the exact news that I want. I don't have to go through 30 some odd pages of print to read one article that I want. I can curate it in real time. I can see exactly what I want. Um, so that's, that's one lens that they're looking at the world through. The next one is networks, not hierarchies. Um, and at the time, when I was working in venture capital, we didn't understand, I didn't understand how this applied to market research. But kind of coming in, one of the things I've learned is that, you know, a lot of times you'll field a project and you'll go to the local sample provider and he's going to do this and, the, and then he's going to go to his provider and, and, it, and it's going to go through you know, all these different hierarchies and you're gonna get recycled panelists and the quality is just gonna go to hell and, and, and it's no good, right? But then along comes this idea of an online community of your audience. And granted, you want these people in there for long term so that you can interact with them. Um, but some other ways that it's starting this kind of networks and hierarchies is we've got the record labels, right? And, and this is a standard industry that we all know. Um, so then along comes this little company, SoundCloud. And has anybody heard of SoundCloud or know what it is? A few hands out there. So SoundCloud is basically the premise is you upload your song and then you can sell it yourself. You don't need a label anymore, right? So it seems pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, and then comes this little girl out of New Zealand and she has the number one label and she has no record label. She did it all on SoundCloud, SoundCloud, SoundCloud by herself. Um, so this is another way that the networks are starting to disrupt the hierarchies. Um, and there's, there's lots of things that are starting to happen in this space. Um, Kickstarter, if you're not familiar with it, this is a way for artistic forums to get the ca capital funding they need to do a first launch. So for example, a camera lens has long been ruled by the Nikors and the Canons. Right, my wife studied photography and I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars we've spent on lenses. 
But this little lens called a Petzval lens comes up on Kickstarter. I spend $300 and I get my wife one of a thousand lenses that have ever been produced. This lens hasn't been in production since the early, or sorry, the late 1800s. And now she's got one of a very few that can work on a digital platform. Um, and there's lots of different ways that now we're also breaking apart what were standardized business models. So these are the things that they're starting to look at and they're applying to multiple industries, right? Banking, you've got Codecademy for education, these things are starting to break up and disrupt. Um, and so as I kind of stand here, I want to challenge you to look at it and say, how can this apply to market research and to our world? And everybody's pounded these things into your head about mobile. So let's take, take a couple steps back and look at mobile pragmatically. And let's look at it as a form of mass communication. Um, you know, starting back in the 1500s, we had print. And I think they had those dot matrix printers back in the 1500s. I'm not sure, it was a little before my time. But um, that, that was print, and print ruled the roost for a long time, but all of a sudden I didn't have to post a kid out on the corner and have him just yelling things. I could put my picture there, walk away, and know that everybody that walked past would see that picture. Um, so a long time goes by. And then we get recordings. And again, cassette tapes, I think that was the first recording. I might be wrong, but again, before my time, right? Um, so cassette tapes are here, and this is like, holy shit, right? We went from like a poster to now I can give you this piece of recorded media, and you can hear my message, and you can see it, and it's like, wow, this is really cool shit, right? Like, this is neat. Okay, so then cinema comes along 10 years later, right? And then we get radio. It's like, I'm, I'm in New York, or you're in Amsterdam, and you're talking to me in New York, right? Like, whoa, <laughs> what just happened? Um, and then a few years later, we get television. And so the, ma the world of mass media is moving forward and changing. So fast forward a little bit farther, and then we get this quirky thing called the internet. And then we had the internet bubble, but the internet kind of stuck around, it didn't go away, and it, and it stayed here. And then we get this thing called the mobile. And this is kind of where we're at today, is we're starting to figure out what is this mobile. We're starting to learn how to use this platform. Um, so let's, let's pose the question, is mobile mass media? Right, we know print is, print's mass media. We know recordings and cinema and all these things are mass media, so what's mobile? Um, let's look at it through some figures, right? So 370,000 babies born every day, okay? Apple produces 525,000. That figure's gone up since then, right? So I'm dealing with some conservative old figures. Once you factor in all those touches and everything, you're closing in on a million devices a day from Apple. Um, Android is kicking the shit out of Apple. So 2.4 million Android devices. And let's not forget Blackberry and Nokia, right? So they're kind of a, a footnote and getting smaller. Um, but look at these devices. We're making more devices than we are people. Right, like think, and, and um, the lady who was just up, she talked about the data that these devices are producing. Um, like they leave trails, that's there, that's available for us. Okay, so if you look at all these other forms of media and then you look at the smartphone, right? The smartphone can, you can publish from the smartphone, you can create print, you can post your blog from there, you can do voice recordings, you can make videos, you can do podcasts, you can watch TV, and you can browse the web. This one little device has swallowed every other form of mass media. Um, let's look at some of the adoption figures. This, this is really amazing to me. We had 50 years to figure out, since this is a research conference, right? We had 50 years to figure out how to ask a question over the phone. What'd you buy for groceries today? Okay, thanks. Right, like 50 years it took us to figure that out. We've had seven years to figure out the smartphone before it hit 50% penetration in the marketplace. Right, so 57, right, like that's, that's the delta, it's huge. Um, these devices are just slamming into the market. Um, it's a really big deal. Just as a, as a data point, look at PayPal's revenue. It's, it's almost doubling every year in just the transactions that they're processing. 
Um, here's another data point, like what is the amount of devices that are connected through this platform? So if you slide it forward and start looking at the projections, it just gets insane. And if you start looking at this, what they call the internet of things, right, these connected devices, this is like your Nest thermostat, your refrigerator, all of these things, these are all data producing points. Um, these are all things that I call passive data producers, where we don't need to ask the consumer, hey, what show did you watch? What did you think about that? Right? We can gather that automatically. We don't need to ask. We shouldn't ask. If you think about Clayton Christensen's example of social credit, if you're asking a question, you're burning up social credit. So don't do that, right? Save those for your, your really important questions. Okay, so here's, here's what's happening though, and, and apply this to research. So this is radio, right? Some guy, they plop him down. He'd I don't know why, nobody could see him, but he'd still wear a suit. He'd go in, he'd put his suit on, and he'd sit down at his microphone, and he'd talk into it all day. So then TV came out, and it was exactly like radio, <laughs> right? Except now they could see the guy in his suit, sitting at the microphone talking. Okay, that, that's what TV was when it first came out. And then there have been a handful of speakers talk about this, but from a, from a production standpoint, the show Sherlock is really taking this concept of dynamic innovation and consumer feedback in a show to new levels, right? So the, the moral of the story is television is not radio. We shouldn't try and create a television based on a radio. Right? It's this totally different interactive platform. And have we done this in other places? Yes, right? Like print to web, we still talk about pages, layout, typography, right? That's what you do in your newspaper. But what should you be doing on a website? It's this completely interactive environment and we still talk about it like it's this newspaper that's gonna go out to print in the morning, right? So web is not print. So where am I going with this, right? Like mobile? Um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't explain how many research or surveys I've seen where it's like, I get it on my phone and I've got 30 buttons, but I can fit seven under my one little fingerprint. Like, that's shit research, right? Like, <laughs> you, you didn't think about designing this for a phone. You've got you've to understand that I'm going to do this with a thumb, right? And that's, that's how I'm going to input my results. So you can't take your research that you designed for these 32 inch screens and shrink it down and put it on a phone. If you do that, that five inch screen is gonna magnify the ignorance that you put into that research. It's gonna be this huge magnifying glass for that. Yeah, but what about engagement on the mobile platform? Um, and these are some kind of interesting things, right? Like fab.com realized that when they engaged on their mobile, you're two times more likely to buy. Um, Financial Times, you're two and a half times more likely to subscribe. Flipboard, you're three times, you're engaged three times longer when you're on the mobile platform. Sephora, uh, have you heard of this where they call it showrooming, where you go in with your phone and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna check and see if Amazon has this cheaper. So a lot of stores really tried to curb this and be like, hey, put that phone in your pocket, you damn thief, right? Like, they'd come after you if you did that in the store. Sephora learned that if you did it in their store, you were actually going to spend more money in the store. You spent $90 more if you pulled your phone out. So they were actually encouraging people, right? Their sales rep would be like, yeah, take a picture, send it to your friends, see if they can get it. Yeah, okay. They learned that. And, and it's everywhere, right? Facebook has flatlined for the last five years, with the exception of mobile. They're growing insanely fast on mobile. Twitter, Pandora. Um, Mobile is where it's being adopted. Um, so, and then to quote another author, this is from uh, David and Goliath, but he's talking about the blitzes in London, and he's talking about how the English um, were very afraid prior to the blitzes coming through. And I just want to take a moment and read this quote, because I think it's really powerful as we start thinking about these new technology paradigms and what's happening. He says, we are all of us not merely liable to fear, we are also prone to be afraid of being afraid. And the conquering of fear produces exhilaration. When we have been afraid that we may panic in an air raid, and when it has happened, we have exhibited to others nothing but a calm exterior, and we are now safe. The contrast between the previous apprehension and the present relief and feeling of security promotes a self-confidence that is 
the very father and mother of courage. And I think that applies to all of us as we start seeing more rapid cycles of innovation and creation and application in the research industry. So I think with that, we'll turn it over to questions.